Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. On the day before Memorial Day. Yeah, it's a holiday weekend. Yep. Yep. So, I, so I'm enjoying me a cocktail while we podcast. It's not a cocktail. It's just whiskey. Well, that too. <laughs> I mean, adding ice does not make it a cocktail. Sure it does. <laughs> it just makes it watered down, just makes tasteless it whiskey. Even more yummy. <laughs> so I went for the Japanese whiskey because, mm. I, I don't know, I think I've decided I have a taste for it. It's good stuff. It really is. And I've always mm. appreciated it. I've always known it was good. But I don't know. I, I was drinking it last night, and I was like, I don't know what it is, but I've really got... I don't know. I'm really digging it. Yeah. I'm a little surprised at that, though, because you don't like scotch. Yeah. And it's definitely scotch-like. I can I can see that. I, I don't know. It's something to do... I mean, it's it's the flavors. Like, mm-hmm. it's something to do with all of the flavors. That's the reason I wanted to pour see what you had and pour a glass of whatever, like, Japanese whiskey you had. Yeah. Just to see what... And it's a different one than the one I have at the house. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It's interesting. It's the best one. The one I have is the best one. The one you have is really good. Um, <laughs> the one I had last night, though, at my house was really good, too. So, yeah. I don't know. And it was crazy. It was a bottle, like, like I don't remember owning that bottle, but I had drank from it. Like, I mean, it was it was opened. <laughs> you remembered it at one time. Yeah, I remembered it. Well, I hadn't drank much from it, but I drank a lot of it last night. I, mm-hmm. I like, went through half that bottle. <laughs> well, what you have there is what I ordered when we went out to dinner after um, our friend's Little sister's graduation the other night. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. That's I, the same one they had at the bar there. Yep. I got gotcha. you. Yep. That I after I ordered, I was worried it was going to be like a thirty dollar pour, but it was only ten. Yeah. It's not not <laughs> so bad. I'd pay ten dollars for a drink of that. Yeah. Yeah, I felt okay about it once I got the bill, but I was like, <laughs> I definitely should have asked before. But yeah. they didn't even know what I was talking about. Yeah, they had trouble finding it. It took two yeah. trips to the bar to find it. <laughs> yeah, it did. I'm like looking at it from my seat. Like I can identify the bottle from yeah. you know halfway across the restaurant, but whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'm which just, one is this? It's Hibiki uh, Harmony. I think is the name of the okay uh, of the um, I don't know the expression. Yeah, I guess um, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I, I do like that one. I've always liked that one. They used to do a um, a twelve year. And this replaced the twelve year. Yeah, yeah. I remember the twelve year. I remember buying it and, or drinking it with you. Yeah, I don't know that I bought any, but I drank it with you. I find it weird because now it doesn't have an age statement on it. So I mean, it gives them a little bit more freedom in terms of picking barrels to to make the blend that they want. Yeah. Um. At the same time, like, so it's probably younger. Yeah. And it's somehow gotten a lot more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> That's by inflation, man. <laughs> yeah, well, part of it is, but it just got. I mean, I remember when they made the change. They had the Hibiki Twelve was like um, sixty dollars here, and then they dropped the Hibiki Twelve and started carrying the Hibiki Harmony, and it was eighty. Yeah, I remember that because they're like what? <laughs> I remember <clears throat> us making quite the fuss about that. <laughs> yeah, and now it's a hundred. Oh wow, that's a hundred dollar bottle. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Don't buy it very often. I don't blame you. <laughs> I try to keep some on hand, though. I just don't drink it very often. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you had some tonight because I'm digging it. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. I don't know where we want to start. I think I think we're due for our foreign policy roundup. Yeah, we've um, kind of neglected foreign policy the past couple of podcasts. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of domestic issues, I guess, um, required some attention. But, yeah, the, the the real danger is still foreign policy. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, nukes everywhere. I, uh, so, my like, my one, like, real political activism, I think, will always be um, elimination of nuclear weapons. Until we do it, right? Until we do it. Yeah. <laughs> Which means it will always be... <laughs> my activism anyway um so you know biden scares the hell out of me there you know the 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 saber saber rattling thing like he's got to be the tough guy and that is what concerned me from the very beginning of his presidency um and he's got you know these 
I don't know. I, I, I think that we can call them neocons, the people around him, the the Sullivans and the Blinkens. Oh, without question. Um, you know, the neocons did start in the Democrat Party, and they became neocons when they moved to the Republican Party because the Democrat Party was so strongly anti-war, they couldn't get their way. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how... I, I think that we have switched back in a lot of ways because there, there seems to be more... Well, you say switch back, but, and, and I think you're right. I do think that there's a switch back that's happened as far as just like the, the war party. Um, but at the same time, both parties are just so invested. Like it, it's hard, like I, I get where you're coming from as a switchback, but it's almost like there's on top of there being a switchback, like there's like a reset to like the minimum amount of like how much war you can be. <laughs> Because both parties yeah. are just infiltrated by it. Yeah. Um, a lot of money in war for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, there's... And that money gets siphoned back into political campaigns. And, uh, yeah. Um, there's... I think that there's... Especially at the at the ground level. At the grassroots level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's more opposition, it seems, on the right to the constant war than on the left. There is. There is right now. Like I say, I mean, we've both been around and active in this long enough to know it hadn't always been that way. No, no, absolutely not. Um, but you're right. Um, there's, And that's why I say, like, I agree with you that there's some sort of reset here because you don't really have any loud um, Democrats that are anti-war. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I, I mean, they're, I say loud. I mean, maybe elected is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, uh, yeah. As far as officials are concerned, I yeah. mean, so look at like Syria a as an example. Um, remember, months ago they had the really terrible earthquake in Syria, it killed like a thousand civilians and and oh, so yeah. forth. I and think they're still recovering from all that. I'm sure that they are because the U.S. has maintained sanctions on Syria, yeah, preventing the countries around them from providing humanitarian aid and help after the. the <sighs> That's so disgusting. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, the. Uh, um, ground shaky thing. Earthquake. <laughs> Earthquake. <laughs> How did that? Like I just used that word. Just How did it slip out of my? Like oh, I've only great. taken a couple of sips of my whiskey so far. I don't know. <laughs> oh man, that earth shaky thing. You gotta watch those. <laughs> my vocabulary, like my brain, is like a sieve now. <laughs> Nothing sticks anymore. Oh. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, when they voted on whether to lift sanctions, so after the the earthquake, yeah. God, I should write that word down. <laughs> yeah, you may need to. <laughs> may come up again. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, when they they voted to uh, lift the sanctions in Congress, um, there were only two people in the House of Representatives that voted against maintaining the sanctions. Yeah. And those two people were Thomas Massey and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Wow. <laughs> that's That's incredible. Yeah. Um, they just had another vote about whether they're condemning, I guess, uh, you know, like condemning Syria's reentry into the Arab League. Yeah. Um, and uh, there were only like a hundred and like low hundreds. No. Yeah. Um, that voted, uh, uh, you know, voted for not doing anything about it. Yeah. I guess. I mean, I, I don't know the specifics. I think it's one of those kind of um you know, we're going to, um, pass legislation saying that we don't approve of kind of things. It's not like a real, it's not really doing anything. I don't think. Yeah. It's um, one of those symbolic votes. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, that means it was like, you know, th uh, 300 and something to like a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, what, I mean, why do we care? Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. If the if the rest of the Arab world wants to bring Syria back in, and they they kicked him out of the Arab League when the uh, civil war started, yeah, that was at least partly because because of uh, U.S. actions over there. Yeah. Um, when like I I love kind of going back to this history because anybody who hasn't been listening to the podcast a long time probably going to have to go do some fact checking. They're going to be like, there's no way that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, with what I'm about to say, but I promise you it is. Yeah. Uh, fact is, check away. <laughs> yeah. 
um, is that in the Iraq War, uh, we um, after 9-11, the U.S. backed the Shia militias against the um, Sunni minority government yeah. um, in, in Iraq. Now, so the because it, it was Sunnis or Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda were Sunnis, yeah. right? Um, and so uh, we backed the Shia militias against, and the Shia are a majority in Iraq, but they didn't have the political power. Yeah. Um, and Saddam Hussein's, uh, you know, represented the the Sunnis as the minority, but they controlled all the government. And the U.S. backed the Shia militias to help, um, you know, overthrow the the Sunni government. And put the Shia majority now in power. Yeah. But Iran is also Shiite. Yeah. And so somewhere along the way, um, the U.S. discovered that they had just fought a war for Iran's allies to take over Iraq. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and um, Seymour Hersh wrote an article called The Redirection. You can go look it up uh, about the reaction to that, um, I don't know, epiphany. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what, the, you know, essentially they said, well, we can't, we can't just change sides in, in our the, war in, in Iraq. In the middle of a war. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do we do instead? We need to, uh, weaken Iran. So we'll overthrow Iran's ally in Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. And so for years, we were literally selling weapons and providing military support for our enemies on one side of the border that are where our friends on the other side of the border. Yeah. So yeah, we're supporting the, the, um, the Sunni insurgents in Syria, uh, Al Nusra front and so forth, which had been Al Qaeda in Syria before them, but they were the moderate rebels when we decided that we were going to help them against Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of the border, those same people were uh, Al Qaeda terrorists, and we needed to to destroy them. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so there are stories of of people going on onto the Syrian side of the border for Al Qaeda getting weapons and equipment and support from the Americans and taking it across the border into Iraq to kill Americans. To fight the Americans, yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I don't know how you can have a more schizophrenic foreign policy than well, that. Well, I mean, to me, that's just a, a prime example of government at its best. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, that's that's what government is good for. Like, I mean, that's the those, baseball effect, it right? It is. It is. That's <laughs> yeah. exactly what it is. Really trying to coin this term. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But that's what it is, man. Like, I mean, that's 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 what you get. That's what you're paying for. Yeah. Um. So n now, uh, years later, the U.S. still has troops in Syria. Yeah. Um, they didn't tell Trump about them, and there, uh, you know, newer, fr more recent reports are suggesting that there are more than they told Biden about too. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, so yeah, so they're not accountable to any president. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Whether it's the good one or the bad one. Which one's which? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly my point. <laughs> so. Uh, now, anyway, um, the the Arab League has invited Syria back into the fold, and um, the U.S. is against it. Yeah. Well, I why? mean, so I, I, there's no reason why. There's no good reason why. Well, no. Um, so has has Assad pretty well regained control of the country? I mean, is the civil More or less, war they still over? Have, uh, no, not quite. I mean, ISIS still has some pockets. I mean, yeah. he has control, really. Yeah. And the truth is that that like the Americans claim that they're still there so that they can fight ISIS, but the Americans could leave Syria. And um, the the Turks and the Syrians and the Kurds could take care of ISIS. For without us. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not, and the Russians probably. I was going to say I the Russians the, are there too, right? Yeah. I don't know that they are so much now. I mean, they have provided support to the to the yeah. Assad government through this. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's possible that without Russian assistance, um, that the American support to overthrow Assad may have worked. Yeah. Of course, the big difference there in terms of international law is that the the 
elected Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad invited the Russians in, but not the Americans. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I suspect that a lot of uh, Russia's military in um, Syria has been redirected, though, at this point. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess you got to think so, given the the scenario that right. If you hadn't heard, Russia's in the middle of another war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's another one going on. So. Um, that seems to be a little bit tougher fight. Yeah, seems to be. So uh, on the coming back to the um, to the nuclear issue, Russia has now begun preparations for placing nuclear weapons in. Uh, um, I was about to say Georgia. That's not right. Belarus. Okay. And um, they say that that's a reaction to the UK providing depleted uranium munitions for the Challenger tanks that they're sending to Ukraine. Oh, okay. And uh, so, you know, it's another tit-for-tat es- escalation in a way. But they, and of course, you know, the West has condemned this, that, you know, Russia can't put their nukes in other countries. That's dangerous. But of course, the U.S. has nukes in the Netherlands and in Germany and in Turkey. And so... Yeah, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Right. Um, why do we get to do this and they don't? And yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that would argue that, um, that well, the U.S. is the more benevolent regime compared to the Russian regime. That well, may the, even be the, true. Uh, maybe, but I would say those people need to look at history. Yeah. Like, I mean, I would disagree with that statement. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that I would disagree with that statement, but certainly the U.S. has done far more damage in the world over the last 20 years than Russia has. Well, and that's that would be my argument. <laughs> you know. Um, the U.S. is responsible for a hell of a lot more deaths yeah. than Russia is. And the U.S. has been involved in a lot more wars than Russia has. And the U.S. has displaced a lot more people than Russia has. Yeah. And most of that time spent just kind of meddling with stuff that, Probably I'd not be meddled with. Yeah. You know, we're still in Somalia. Really? I mean, I'm not surprised. The U.S. is still in Somalia. It's it's now the longest war in America's history. Wow. um, Because we went into Somalia not long after we went into Afghanistan. We're still in Somalia. Yeah. Really? Why? Yeah. I mean, we're presumably we're fighting al-Shabaab, but I don't know. It, it, It seems kind of absurd to me. Um, on the flip side of, uh, Russia putting nukes in Belarus, uh, the U S um, okay. Do you remember, do you remember back when Trump was president? I do. And he started, um, I, I, you know, some like low level diplomacy with North Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it was fun times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Kim Jong-un, stopped doing missile testing Mm -hmm. and we had years where North Korea didn't do any additional missile testing. Yeah. Um, No, no to, to all cards on the table, there was a lot of like provocation that led up to all of that. Yeah. I mean, he started off like just cause I know that people are going to listen to this and, and like think that we're like ignoring a part of history. And I just Mm want to clarify that like, we're not like, it's true. But then, yeah. But but it did lead to the right direction. Like they in after the prov, uh, the amount of provocation, there was mm-hmm. some coming together that happened. Yeah, and that Trump is went not into a the bad DMC thing. And they yeah. had real talks and yeah, and so and things calmed down. Yeah, there. because I I think a big part of it is that they just want recognition. Yeah, well, and that's oh man, that's to be treated like they're part of the community. Yeah. Um. And, uh, so of course, you know, we know that North Korea has, um, has some nuclear weapons, has yeah. a nuclear weapon, maybe has, yeah. has a few, there's I'm not some sure kind, where the there's number some is. kind of capability. Yeah. There. They have yeah. some nuclear capability and they're not giving it up because, you know, saw what happened in Libya. Exactly. And, uh, and for those that don't know that story, um, Muammar Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program and then was promptly invaded and sodomized to death. Yeah. In the streets. <laughs> um, and Kim Jong-un probably doesn't want that. That's not, that's not, not a very flattering way to go. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's not giving up nukes and the, the talks ended up being kind of torpedoed because the, you know, the first request from the U S government was that he give up nukes. And then they said, we'll give up nukes if you give up sanctions. And 
nobody would budge and it kind of fell apart. And then of course there was uh what's his name, the Walsh guy with the Oh, the, um, um Bolton. Oh, the guy yeah, John Bolton. John Bolton. Yeah. Um, so then Bolton, like, you know, tweeted something. Actually, I think he, didn't he tweet something about Gaddafi? I don't remember. I think he tweeted something about Gaddafi. Yeah. Um, and that really kind of put an end to it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, well, he was torpedo in that from the beginning. Yeah. He, he didn't the the fact that he was even there was irritating enough. So then Biden enters office and uh, cuts off all diplomacy with North Korea again and, um, you know, starts threatening and adding sanctions and whatever else he did um, just to antagonize um, Kim Jong-un. And now the well, and since then, um, there's been something like 200 missile tests from North Korea Including, you may remember the one that that overshot Japan. Yeah, I, I was going to say there's been. I was going to say there's been some very provocative ones. I don't remember specifics, but yeah. I remember there were a few that were like, "Whoa!" Now that and it was. Now that I think about it, it was the one that went over Japan because, like, that's dangerous. Yeah, like that. I mean, that's plenty of reason for Japan to be worried about that. Obviously, because I mean, it's not like the North Koreans are experts at this. <laughs> like there's plenty of reason, plenty of ways that that can go bad. Yeah. So, well, um, currently, or maybe just recently is the way to say it. The U S and South Korea. Um, and I think maybe Japan, but I, I don't remember now, uh, did, um, their largest ever military drills on the border really? with North Korea. Um, doing war games about how to attack and demilitarize North Korea with a quick strike and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, which was also provocative and will certainly result in more missile tests. Yeah. And, uh, at the same time, Biden announced that, um, that they are going to dock a nuclear armed submarine in South Korea. Oh, really? Yeah. So it'll be the first time that we've had, I mean, now the truth is, that submarines can be all around South Korea all the time. And yeah, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say certainly are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that you're announcing that you're docking a nuclear armed sub in South Korea. That's a provocation. Is it another like really explicit provocation? Yeah, absolutely it is. And totally mm -hmm. unnecessary. Yeah. I mean, what, what point, what does the, the question and oh, it's so irritating, but when it comes to things like this, particularly the mm -hmm. question you should always be asking is, does this make the world a safer place? Yeah. And the answer is no. Yeah. And obviously the answer to this is no, but, but it's this macho, like, well, we got to show we've got the, you know, we're swinging the bigger dick. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we talked about that during the campaigns that this was the big concern about Biden. Like, uh, we'll go outside and do push-ups and like all yeah. those like weird things that yeah. he was like, saying to people when he, he thought that he was being challenged in some way or yeah. belittled or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I, I said, this was my big concern about this guy in the first place is that he's uh, he's so defensive and so intent on proving how tough he is. Exactly. That this is my big is, fear about Is him. that the person we want to give the biggest military on the planet to? Yeah. Maybe yeah. not. <laughs> uh, so, not saying Trump was that much better. I mean, but but in many ways he was. Well, he, he talked big. Um, and then, but it, the problem with the, the problem I, with I Trump think it always was, had that goal though. Like he went and he, you know, he threatened North Korea and he went on about North Korea and he used it to, uh, to negotiate, to negotiate. Yeah. And, and that's, it's so crazy to like, like when you would look at Trump and Biden just side by side, you'd be like, well, clearly Trump would be the bigger threat with nuclear weapons. Cause that yeah. was always what the left tried to use against him. You with really want finger on, on the, the button. button. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. finger on the button thing. But when you really like dive in and start looking and especially at their records, because they both have them now, like Biden's the bigger threat. Like Biden's the Seems one to be. to be more worried about, you know? And yeah. I mean, for all of Trump's bluster, I think his, his heart was always it, at least, in, in this particular scenario. In foreign policy, generally. Yeah, it was in the right place. A big part, and I just want to say, the 
biggest problem that Trump had in that respect mm-hmm. is he just wasn't educated enough. Yes, that's absolutely true. And of course, the the thing that I think that he did that was the worst thing he did while he was in office was leave the JCPOA. Yeah. Well, and there's absolutely and and once again, which I think is the it, Iran nuclear deal for those that yeah. don't know all these acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's strictly though because it just and not educated enough, wrong mm-hmm. people around him, and yeah. just didn't doesn't know. You know. Yeah. And some of that's big guy in the room. Like that was a that was a deal that um that uh, Barack Obama, Obama yeah. had signed had signed, and it was we were going to be against anything Obama did, regardless. You know, so yeah. there was some of that. And as much as anything, the thing that really irks me now about that is that the reason that we uh, have supported um, until recently, I mean, we're still supporting that they're just not really fighting anymore. Um, the uh, Saudi the quote Saudi led war in Yemen um, was to, to placate them yeah. as Obama said, placate memo, the Saudis. to placate them for signing the JCPOA. Yeah. Then we left the JCPOA and continue to support the, <laughs> the Saudi war Continued to placate the Saudis. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Like at least yeah. if you were going to leave it, you could have stopped the war in Yemen. Yeah. Oh, well oh. he wasn't the best. <laughs> no, <laughs> without question. <laughs> uh, so um, back to uh, Ukraine, though. We're kind of bouncing all over the world yeah, here. But. Well, I mean, but I mean, we're kind of. I mean, the the overall theme though is the nuclear weapons. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of backing off of that now. There's uh, well, I guess that's not really true because that this is certainly no because the Ukraine is for, like is yeah. is the flashpoint for this situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I listened uh, to John J. Mearsheimer give a talk, um, recently and, uh, Mearsheimer is from the realist school of, uh, foreign policy or international relations, I guess. Um, and he's been pretty good about predicting outcomes of, of various events and so forth. He's not perfect, yeah. but yeah. I mean, this is a, like a complicated thing that you're well, dealing yeah, with. Yeah, he's and, got his ear to the ground, though. Yeah. And um, so, I, I, like, one of the things that he said that he was wrong about is that he said that China could not rise to power peacefully. Yeah. But they have. Yeah. Well, a- and... and, and I, at least so far. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, in in his defense on that, which I don't know the details of what all he said or whatever, mm-hmm. but my guess would be is a big reason that they the Chinese have been able to do that is because we've done the opposite. And well, it kind of opens a lane. It, maybe. I, I think that uh, um, he attributes a lot of the errors to things that are left out of his, out of the theory because you just can't include everything. Well, it's yeah. like you know, you necessarily have to simplify these theories. Yeah. Or there's too much to work with. Yeah. Um, so he said one of the things that's left out is domestic politics. Yeah. So pushes internally one way or another aren't a part of his equation. Yeah. Yeah. Um and that you know and sometimes domestic poli- politics can you know heavily well, affect it's, it's unpredictable. foreign policy yeah i mean you don't know where the tides are going to go yeah you know? um but in in this case he's he you know he certainly predicted the war <laughs> yeah um he predicted the annexing of provinces here by russia yeah um he is currently predicting russia annexing another four provinces before they stop their movement yeah um, the the primarily Russian speaking Russian ethnic provinces in the the south and east of Ukraine he thinks will be captured by Russia. Yeah. Um, and part of some negotiation for peace, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe actually, that's that's not what he is, predicts. This yeah. is the scary part of what he was talking about. Okay. Um, he he says that he doesn't see any realistic prospect for a meaningful peace. Yeah. In so, Ukraine and Russia. So we're probably, I mean, my guess would be, and I've kind of been afraid of this from the beginning, mm-hmm. is we're going to end up in the same situation we're in with North Korea. Yes. Where we're just in a, like, stalemate of an armorist or whatever. You uh, armistice. Call. Armistice. Is yeah. that what it is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Armistice. Armistice. Yeah. 
but that's that's been my prediction pretty early on from this was that mm-hmm. that's that's where we're going to end up here with Russia and Ukraine is that we're not going to get an actual I mean we're going to end up with some kind of ceasefire fire that just kind of sticks. Yeah. Well, and that's what the the US is kind of preparing people for now is that they have started talking seriously about a frozen conflict in Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, Mearsheimer says that there's two main reasons that that they can't have a meaningful peace negotiation. Um, first is the territorial issue, because neither side is willing to budge. Yeah. So Ukraine says that uh, a um, prerequisite for any negotiation is that Russia give leave all territories in the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, which don't just include the Donbass and the other two, Zaporizhia and um, Kherson, the other two provinces that Russia has annexed, but also Crimea. Yeah. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It ain't happening. Then. There's right, no just... way that Russia is abandoning Crimea. No. Crimea and they, has and they been... they have no reason to. Like, well, that's true, too. But, uh, I mean, as much as anything else, you want to talk about history here. Um, Crimea has been Russia's uh, Black Sea port for, like, 250 years. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, there's no reason for them to give that up. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I mean, Crimea was given to Ukraine in the Soviet Union in, like, the 1950s. Yeah. Or something. And it was just, like, a symbolic gesture anyway because... They were all answerable to the Kremlin at that time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't matter. Um, it was just a way of, uh, it was a way for Khrushchev to, um, to, uh, I guess. Placate his governors. Yeah. I, I mean, he was trying to shore up support. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that, that'll never happen. There's no way, if, if both sides are going to be intractable, intractable excuse me about this then it it can't it won't it's a non-starter for both sides yeah um secondly is the neutrality issue yeah and here's where like it, it actually makes sense now going back to the territorial thing it honestly doesn't make sense for ukraine to try and hang on to these provinces because they don't want to answer to kiev It'll be well, a fight for them the whole time. And it's been a fight for them forever. Yeah. Like, it's not like this is like a new thing. Exactly. Like, I mean, the, a lot of these provinces want to be Russian. Now, Russia has probably lost some support in their prosecution of this war yeah. that would otherwise have been on their side. But it's not like if Russia leaves that um, these people flock back to Ukraine and say, oh, yeah, well, actually, no. we've decided that we do want to answer to the government in Kiev. No, no they're going to fight against that, too. They'll want to be independent. Yeah. Like, that's the only other option that there would be. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, if you want to entertain third options, but that's not going to happen. Well, here's the other option that I am concerned about because uh, the Ukrainian government has um, shown some tendency towards this is um, ethnic cleansing. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> and, none and, of and us to be fair, <laughs> Russia has shown some tendency towards this too. I'm not discounting yeah. that the Russians have been brutal yeah. as well, but, but the Ukrainians have done it also. Like, don't think that the Ukrainians are, are the white hats here. Yeah. There's no good guys in this fight. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you, you remember some of those early stories about the Russians, uh, killing a bunch of civilians before they left territory when under closer investigation, it does seem that it was the Ukrainian forces that came in and killed everybody that had been compliant with the Russians. Yeah. Not yeah. the other way around. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Ugh. you know, there's that possibility. So, and then back to the neutrality issue, like I said, this one makes more sense to me because Russia, has real and I think legitimate security concerns about Ukraine being closer to the West yeah. right there on our border. Yeah. Um, they've got historical reason to be concerned about this. Yeah. Um, but what they've also done by invading the Ukraine, I'm supposed to not say the Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> apparently a lot of people discount anybody that says the Ukraine. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't heard this, so it's news Whatever. to me. Because <laughs> it was like the the borderlands. That's kind of how what it meant in old uh, Russian. Anyway, okay. 
Um, like calling, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Germania in the Roman times, like the barbarian lands or the outskirts or whatever. It was the same. It's the same kind of thing. Okay. Anyway, um, <clears throat> in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine has, by invading Ukraine, Russia has given them a real legitimate security concern. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that this could happen again. Yeah. And that they don't have the power to repel a Russian invasion. That, yeah. No matter what they keep saying. We've got the spring offensive this now summer, and it's looking like it may be next spring before they can launch any kind of offensive. Yeah. It'll be the next spring offensive. Because <laughs> yeah. um, I don't see it happening. <laughs> they just don't have the manpower, it seems to me. Yeah. But anyway... Now Ukraine has even more reason to want to not be neutral. Yeah, to join NATO. Yeah, to have uh, defensive alliances or security guarantees from the West. Yeah. And Russia sees those as an absolute threat. They're not going to allow that. Like, Russia is not going to allow that. Yeah. So, So they're in an impasse again. (laughs) Yeah. And so for these two reasons, primarily, Mearsheimer says that there won't be a real, like a real peace agreement. Yeah. So we're probably looking at just like a stalemate, mm-hmm. which is... Now, there's some other things that arise from this, of course, uh, that are of uh, of real concern to the rest of us. Yeah. Uh, you know, besides just like, it's again, it's a flashpoint for a nuclear war. Yeah. Um. You know, the longer this goes on, the more likely some accident will happen or something will happen to... All right, so let's give a specific example. So now um, Biden had said at the beginning that uh, F-16s were a no-go. Yeah. Like, we will never give F-16s to um, Ukraine. We don't want them... We don't want to give them any weapons that they can use to actually strike Russia. Yeah. Now, to be fair, the truth is there's no way they can strike Russia, even with F-16s. <laughs> even with those, I mean, yeah. but, well, okay, that they could launch a a successful... Well, yeah. it depends on how you define success, I guess. But they they can't invade Russia yeah. with F-16s. They, I guess they could launch a successful strike with F-16s because they... Maybe. You really think they'd get over the border? Uh, no, I don't think that they would get over the border, but they don't have to. Okay, okay. Yeah, because they could launch them from their border. Yeah. Okay. You um, you think what they launch gets through though? How yeah, good, how good uh, is Russia defense? Russian well, missile defense. Okay. Their missile defense um, can be breached. Okay. Their air defense can probably be, can't. Yeah, uh, yeah. In terms of like, there's no way that one of those jets is, is getting, getting there. in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the F-16 is not a stealth jet. Yeah. It, it's a you know an old fourth generation jet. It's it's. It's still one of the best jets in the world. I yeah. mean, it really is. Like the yeah. the F sixteen is one of the best dogfighters in the history of Out aviation. There. Yeah, um, it doesn't stand up to the fifth generation jets like uh, the F twenty two Raptor, of course, or yeah. the Russian Su fifty seven uh, Felon. Yeah. Um, but it, it's uh, it's a very but capable it's solid. Yeah, it's a very yeah. capable jet. <laughs> Man, there's so many things to to address with this. But the other thing is that the like going from um, the MiG 29s, I think is primarily what, what yeah. the Ukrainians have. Um, going from the MiG 29s to the F 16s isn't that easy. Yeah. And they're talking about. Well, I mean, like, they've already said six months. Yeah, but that's not enough. You don't think so? I, I mean, it's enough to be able to take off, launch a missile, and land. Yeah. But it ain't <laughs> enough to 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 bring the full quality of that aircraft. Absolutely not. Like, there's yeah. no way they could get into a dogfight with that thing. Yeah. After just that amount of training, no yeah. matter how good they are. Yeah. It, I mean, it's just, it's even just not even enough. if they were just that. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm saying this. This is based on the opinions of professionals. This isn't. Yeah. Just, this isn't. This isn't Mike the pilot. <laughs> yeah. This isn't just my opinion, but yeah. you know, the people out there say that like, this is a really complicated aircraft Yeah, and that you can't effectively dogfight the, the Russian jets yeah. um, with six months of training yeah. that it'll be for takeoff, launch land kind of operations. Yeah. Um, because it does have Which they effective can... range on air, air to ground missiles. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, they can, they can launch in Kiev. Yeah. I mean, like they can take off in Kiev, launch their missiles, Land in Kiev. 
That's what they might be capable of doing because the Russians have some of the best air defenses in the world. Yeah. I mean, I would expect them to. So if those jets travel very far, they're probably going to get shot down out of the sky. They're going to know about it. like not even considering the fact that the the Russian jets are already patrolling the skies there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would expect Russia to have air superiority. Yes, absolutely. In in this fight. Absolutely. Um, That brings in another problem, though, of course, too, because... So if the Ukrainians can't effectively make use of the F-16s, who's going to fly them? Yeah. And why are we sending them in the first place? Well, we're not. We've just allowed other countries to... Oh, we've allowed other countries. I got you. To sell them. Um, Now, (laughs) another problem that I came across from uh, a blog that seems to be pretty knowledgeable um, was talking about uh, just like the difficulty of maintaining F-16s, which has been a problem with American weapons throughout. Like yeah. the philosophies of old Soviet jets and American jets is not the same. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like the difference between the, the Kalashnikov and the M-16, right? Yeah. So the, um, you can do more damage to the Kalashnikov and have it still fire. Yeah. Or, Put it in worse conditions and have it still fire than you can the M16. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, that's well known. <laughs> yeah, and the jets are the same way. So, um, the the Russian MiG-29, the old Soviet MiG-29 that the Ukrainians have, yeah, um, can take off from dirty runways because it has a, a, a secondary air intake for the engines. So when it's on the ground, um, the the primary intake underneath the plane closes. And um, some uh, intakes above the wings open, yeah, so that it can still draw air in through the engine yeah. without drawing in ground debris. debris. Yeah, yeah. All right, like gravel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sticks, like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, the F sixteen. Go look up an F sixteen. Yeah. There's this giant air t- intake right under the cockpit. Yeah. It's about 30, 36 inches off the ground. And that is the only air intake. And when that engine's running, it is a giant vacuum cleaner. Yeah, it's sucking it up. All right. And uh, the the danger of um, ground debris is a real danger. Like the, yeah. it, these slight well, because, little nicks and cuts can really destroy an engine. Yeah. And you may not even know immediately, which is the real scary part. So you get in the air. Like, right? yeah. And then something goes off balance and the engine rips itself apart. And that's, yeah, and that's, the, <laughs> and that's, the, that's how the story done. ends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so. Like what this guy's conclusion was, like, is in order to to have these F sixteens take off in um, Ukraine, they can't do like they've been doing, like moving things around by night, taking off from um, runways that haven't been completely maintained and so forth. You can't do that in an F sixteen. Yeah. So, because the Americans on bases where F sixteens are taken off have people going out constantly picking up every little bit and piece of anything yeah, off of the runway. Because these these planes are taken off from areas we firmly control. Yes. And that's that's a big part of the US military in general. Yeah. Like I mean it's the most powerful military in the world and it our our equipment reflects that. Mm-hmm. So like even when you talk about the Abrams tanks, when when we we're talking about sending those over, it's the same scenario with those. This this is some of the best equipment on the planet for fighting a war a war where you're where you have the infrastructure mm-hmm. to just like have the best stuff there is yeah. when you try to take that best stuff there is and give it to these smaller countries that don't have the infrastructure to maintain and to use this equipment mm-hmm. they might as well not even have the equipment yeah and and this guy was saying that the Russians have shown that their intelligence is good enough to recognize that a an airfield has suddenly been picked clean. Yeah, <laughs> of right? all the little bra- blades of grass and gravel on the runway and things patched up and so forth, which you'd have to do to, to launch take the X-16. these things off. Yeah, and so they know that if they see a runway like that, it's either been used or about to be used for F-16s. Yeah, really, and. <laughs> and, and I mean, it would make sense to me to just like carpet bomb a bunch of gravel over that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, <laughs> God, that would be so much cheaper too, right? Yeah, right. I'll like you don't even gravel. have to bomb it; just dump gravel on it. Um. And uh, 
the the other danger here though is like even if they could use them effectively yeah um there's a real danger of the american made f16s being used against russia yeah and then well and that's that's the fear that i think that your average listener to this podcast would be worried about because that's what that's what the media has talked about. That's kind of what's been out there is, well, you know, there's a threat if we give them these weapons that they'll use them against the Russian homeland. Yeah. And that could be the catalyst for World War III because, you know, we authorize this. Yeah. The, it makes any country that's providing them a, a legitimate target. Exactly. And um, now, to settle everyone's fears, yeah, Zelensky has promised that they won't use... F-16s to <sighs> I forgot about attack that. Russian territory. Yeah, I mean, that changes everything as it far does, as I'm concerned. Now, like, um, because just all s- politicians are to be trusted all the time, <laughs> right. regardless. Remember, you can't see... <laughs> regardless of party affiliation, they're all telling the truth. They're all honest actors. Like, that's that's just... That's how politics works. Remember, we're, we're audio only, so people can't see <laughs> sarcasm. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, so, uh, okay, problem number one here yeah. is that um, Ukraine considers Crimea Ukrainian territory. Yeah. And All so right, does so, Russia. And, well, no, Russia. Well, no, they, were, they consider it Russian is what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad. Um, that would have worked if I had said Ukraine considers Crimea their own territory. Okay, yeah, yeah, then yeah. Then you could have said Then I could have Russian. said that, yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, the other thing is that, you know... Um, Ukraine has already promised not to use equipment or to attack the Russian homeland. Yeah. Um, but we have uh, the drones, the terrorism, the assassinations. The Ukraine um, intelligence just recently said expressly, like explicitly, that they were trying to assassinate Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And um, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who's the leader of the Wagner Group. Yeah. Um, and a couple other people. Uh, Shoigu, who's the defense minister. I can't remember. Dim- no, it's not Dimitri. I don't remember his first name. Sergei, I think. Uh, Sergei Shoigu. Lavrov? No. Oh, is, is this but, a uh, one? but Lavrov might be. No, Lavrov's not on there. Um, uh, Gerasimov, uh, okay. who's the, the Russian military head. Okay. Um, anyway, they've said that they're trying to assassinate these people yeah. and that they have tried in the past. Um, to assassinate Putin. They said that they tried as far back as March of 2022. Yeah. And failed miserably, by the way. But um, but they still tried. But they had tried. Now, uh, Naftali Bennett said that when they were um, helping with the negotiations a year ago between Ukraine and Russia, that, uh, that one of the things that he had gotten, a, a promise that he'd gotten from um, Vladimir Putin, because Zelensky was terrified... Um, was that that the Russian Federation would not try to assassinate Vladimir Zelensky? And I, I just have to believe that there's that they haven't because I feel like if they had, they'd been more successful. Well, what's interesting is that so there's been um, a, a Ukrainian group using American-made weapons that crossed the border into Russia and um, and hit some uh, border settlements. Yeah. I don't know. That was like two weeks ago, maybe. Okay. Uh, maybe not that long ago. And then, of course, there was the the drone attack on the Kremlin. Yeah, that, yeah. That um, made that was foiled. Big headlines. Yeah. What What's interesting about that is that I I don't believe that Vladimir Zelensky has been in Ukraine since that happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's probably smart. It It probably is smart because there's there's no reason to think that the Russians are going to honor their word about not trying to assassinate. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky when Ukraine is openly saying that they're trying to assassinate Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, but it would be far more dangerous for Putin to, for the Russian Federation to assassinate Zelensky on some other allies land. Yeah. Than in Ukraine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's probably good reason for that. The, the point being though, is that, that Zelensky has already lied about what he's going to use uh, American or Western provided weapons to do. Yeah. He's already attacked places that he promised he wouldn't. Yeah. And I would expect him to. Yeah. Like, but this time is is the this is the real deal. This like, time he means it. Yeah. 
Well, sarcasm. Again. The the fortunate thing is, is it sounds like the Ukraines just don't have the capability to use this to its fullest mm-hmm. extent. But well, but the the other, th- you got to remember when you're um, when you're making these kind of decisions or analyzing it for that matter. Like yeah, we're doing. <laughs> yeah, um, is that it is an absolutely in Ukraine's interest to draw the U S or NATO into this war. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, that's the, that's their goal. They've made, I mean, there's, a, they haven't really done a good job of disguising that. Like that's no, been, that's they've made that very blatant that they're trying to pull us into this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, it, and so there's no incentive for him to keep his word on this. Oh, there's no incentive at all. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that may err on our side is that they're just not capable of doing something to pull us in mm. is, is, is the hope at least. Well, yeah. Um, it, it depends more on Russia's accent actions than Ukraine's, I think. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's certainly, I, I think that, well, there's no reason I think that for, there's more for confidence Russia. in that statement from you than I have anyway. Well, um, yeah, but there's no reason for, I mean, as the, it, with the host of issues that, us and Russia have right now. Like Russia doesn't want us involved in this war. Like that's, that's, that's that's the last thing they want. But Russia has also accepted that we're already involved in this war. Well, and they're, they're not wrong to, to assess that because Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we're involved in this war. Um, I mean, because I, I don't agree with any of the support we've been given, and that I, it's dangerous. Like mm-hmm. the this whole situation is unnecessarily dangerous. Yes, um, I don't agree with Russia going in there, but at the same time, we don't we don't have a dog in this fight. Like this is not our border. This is Russia's border, and Russia is in a situation. Russia can't lose this war. Like they can't just lose a war on their border like this. like Well, it, the problem with this whole thing has been um, that countries don't seem to be accept, able to accept, certainly the U.S., yeah. um, but I, I think a lot of countries yeah. uh, can't accept the real um, legitimate security concerns of their neighbors. Yeah. I mean, there's... We discounted Russia's security concerns. Putin's been screaming at the top of his lungs for more than a decade. Yeah. That this is a problem. Yeah. Like that we cannot have Ukraine be a part of a Western military alliance right here. Yeah. Because I have real legitimate security concerns. And of yeah. course, at the same time, can't discount Ukraine's security concerns with Russia right there on their border. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of this was exacerbated by them, by their treatment of their Russian ethnic population. Yeah. Uh, their refusal to follow through with the Minsk Accords. Yeah. Um, of course, that's partly the, the West's fault, too. And now, at this point, I, I don't know, I, Mearsheimer didn't talk about this, but I think like one of the big um, impediments to negotiation is just the fact that the Minsk Accords were uh, agreed upon by Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany. Yeah. Um, and France and Germany have both their officials have come out in the, in the last few months and said that the Minsk Accords were never intended to be implemented, that yeah. they were just a delaying tactic to give time for the West to arm and prepare Ukraine for a war with Russia. Yeah. So why would Russia then go in and negotiate again? Well, yeah. With these same people who have already been duplicitous. Who have already admitted that they had they they weren't honest actors in the first place. Right. They weren't negotiating in good faith. Yeah. Um but one of Russia's primary international issues that they bring up over and over again is that that nation's security concerns need to be addressed. Yeah. That you need to consider other nations' security when you're making decisions. That this is a joint thing. Like, if we want to maintain peace, we all have to be, um, you know, receptive to the the complaints of everybody else or to the concerns of everybody else. Absolutely. Uh, Which, to me, I mean, you know, I don't know how honest they are in that. But... Um, it seems like a far more realistic approach to uh, international relations than the, the one, than the one that the United States has taken. Yeah, I mean we're involved in this conflict a world away from us. Like, mm-hmm. so, and I mean, all you have to do—it's as so simple as just putting the shoe on the other foot. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we were in a conflict with Mexico, 
and Russia was sending weapons in and doing all of this stuff. Like, how would we take that? Yeah. I mean, would we take that sitting down? There's no way. Yeah, no, absolutely. We would. Um, but it's because we're the, the big dog. As, um, yeah. Oh, no, no, I can't think of the name of the author. Uh, wrote the book about Vietnam called Perils of Dominance. Um, yeah. uh, Gareth Porter. Okay. I think it was Gareth Porter. I think it was Gareth Porter. I'm pretty sure it was Gareth Porter. Anyway, yeah. uh, I mean, that's what he talks about. He says that the Vietnam War wasn't um, wasn't fought because of uh, the U.S. concern that they were actually being challenged by Russia, but because they knew that they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. And they wouldn't have fought the war if they actually thought that there was some kind of peer <laughs> competition there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but because they knew that, that because we the had U.S. The upper knew hand. Yeah. that they had the upper hand, right? Yeah. Um, that that's why we fought in Vietnam. Yeah. Just showboating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's all I've got. Uh, let's see. How do we end this in a... Um, <laughs> in a positive light? Yeah. I've been trying to do a lot of reconciliation at the end of the podcast because I think it's important that the, you know, the enemies are the governments, not the people. And yeah. I, I suppose that, they, yeah, that's the point here um, yeah. is that, you know, like... Don't blame the Russians. Yeah. So I don't know if I ever mentioned it on the podcast, but it was like maybe a month ago it was the world chess championship. Oh yeah. We um, talked the, about it, but not on the podcast. We yeah. didn't. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So it, the, the FIDE world chess championship, um, occurred like a month ago and, um, and it was Ding Liren against, uh, Jan Nepomnichi. Jan Nepomnichi is Russian. I had to look that up Yeah. because they, had the Chinese uh, flag for Ding Liren. Yeah. Um, but they had the FIDE flag, which is just the organization, the chess organization. Chess organization. Yeah. Um, flag for Jan Nepomnichi. And I, like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, uh, I mean, Jan Nepomnichi isn't a recognizably Russian name. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. But I was like, I bet this guy's Russian. Yeah. Yeah. Because I only recently, like, I only got into chess in the last year and he hadn't been playing a lot of major tournaments. So yeah. I didn't know him. Um, so I looked it up and sure enough, he's Russian. He's Russian. Yeah. But we can't show the Russian flag, yeah. even though the event occurred, was in Kazakhstan. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was kind of blown away by it. I was like, I can't believe that the politics has penetrated that far. Um, that, that, that it's like, it's like Russia or Russian is a bad word. Yeah. Like it's yeah. a curse. Yeah. And it's not these people's fault. It damn sure isn't this great chess player's fault that yeah. that Russia has invaded uh, Ukraine. Even if you discount all the provocation that led to it anyway. I mean, I, I still, yeah. uh, you know, without discounting all the provocation that led to it, I still agree that that this is illegal, that it's not justified. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, that it's not an appropriate response. Innocent people are dying over something that they shouldn't be dying over. Absolutely. Like, bottom line. But it's not the Russians' fault. Yeah. It's not the people of Russia. Yeah. Um, any yeah. more than, uh, you know, blaming the average U.S. citizen for our involvement in the Middle East is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember world traveling and, like, trying to explain to people that I don't agree with my government. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, so, um, anyway. Almost, almost like exclusively, <laughs> I don't agree with my government. Yeah. And I would, uh, I may have to like put together something for real to try and back this up. So I don't, I, I don't have like a, I guess a real strong argument right here as I'm saying this, but I firmly believe that without government, there isn't war anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think... I think There's that individual could, conflicts. I was going to say, and you may find skirmishes, Yeah, but you don't find, you don't find war on the scale we see it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's... I mean, but, I mean, you're also talking about pressing a button and there's no government, you know? Yeah. But... If only. If Where I, is if, that button? Yeah, once we find it, man. <laughs> yeah, my finger on that button. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we can wrap it up there. Um, sorry we're late getting this out. Uh, something came up that yeah. was more important to me on Friday. So. But we still got it out. Um, yeah. 
and we expect to do another one on a normal day <laughs> yeah, this coming week. Hopefully Thursday, Friday, we'll yeah. be doing this again. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, like and share, comment, subscribe, tell your friends, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Like all that engagement helps us, um, helps us reach more people. And that's, that's what we want to do. For the uh, show. But we really appreciate those of you that are already listening. Yep. And, uh, I, you know, of course you'll continue to do so, right? Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, that should be a given. Yeah. So uh, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later. Later.